I am going to talk about money, which um, is always the big question, right? You know, how are we going to get the money we need to fix up these halls? And I'll beg your pardon here at the very beginning because as you, I'm sure, can hear, um, I've been fighting Central Texas pollen for about the last week and a half. Although it's better over here, I'm still dealing with the lingering effects, so I'm on a ton of cold medicine. I've got my Kleenex and my water. Um, I apologize for the condition of my voice, um, but um, we're going to soldier through together. Okay, um, I'm a historic preservation consultant. I'm in the Houston area, and since I got to Texas in 2005, I've been helping a lot of people, mostly nonprofit organizations, but also private property owners, including some dance halls, raise money to fix up their historic buildings. And uh, first of all, let me just tell you that um, there are almost no grants for historic buildings. So if you have someone who buys a historic building and says, where's all the grants? You can tell them, um, sorry, there are almost no grants for historic buildings um, unless they are falling down and it's super, super, super important. Uh, so um, we have to figure out where the money's gonna come from, from grassroots, fundraising and the community. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, when we're looking for money, when we need it, that means um, not when the air conditioning unit has gone out in the middle of July when we've got a band coming next week and now everybody's scrambling around in a mad panic trying to figure out where the money's going to come from. Our better bet is to go ahead and start building a fund for that money so that we have some put back when those kinds of things happen. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is based on the work of the Kresge Foundation. It was established in 1924 with a $1.6 million gift at that time from Sebastian Kresge, who had been one of the founders of America's first five and ten cent store. His company went on to be known as Kmart. And since 1924, that $1.6 million gift has turned into a $3.2 billion endowment. Kresge Foundation, which has nothing to do with those stores now, um, for many, many years, invested money through challenge grants in construction and renovation projects in communities. And when we had the economic contraction of the U.S economy back in 2007-2008, like many grant-making foundations, they took a step back and looked at their giving strategies and how well they were working. And what they discovered was that many of their grant recipients were repeat requesters. So this organization would ask for, get a challenge grant, raise the match, fix up their building, and then that was it. 25 years later, having deferred maintenance for 25 years, they would be back because their building would be in a pickle again. You know, they hadn't done everything, so now they needed more money. Interestingly, not everybody was in that same position, though, because some of the grant recipients got the challenge grant, raised the match, fixed up their building, and then they kept raising money to fix up their building in the future. So the Kresge Foundation studied this for a couple years. They eventually stopped giving out grants for buildings altogether. But in the meantime, they published a report about the best practices of those organizations that had figured out how to become financially sustainable. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is based on that research. So it's not just something I've dreamed up in all my spare time. One of the things that we run into a lot with dance halls, as you've heard over and over and over again, is the roof. Okay, we need a new roof. Um, we all know roofs that you know have been on a building for 40 or 50 years, and they're still mostly doing their job. But a lot of times, you just get to the end of that roof's life. It needs to be replaced, and for a big building, that can be very, very expensive. It's very hard to come up with that money. All of a sudden, or even in an emergency situation, there's a windstorm or a tree goes through the top of it or whatever. 
So um, we're going to talk a lot about roofs today for that reason as an example. All right, so today what I'm going to talk about, some key terms, I'm going to talk about planning, um, how to create a building maintenance and system replacement plan, um, how to build the fund, and then I'm going to talk a little bit um, about an example, which is one of the SPJS T halls, it's one of the round halls up in Buckholz. So, building reserves fund, this is just a savings account, basically. You put a bunch of money in there so it's there when you need it. Um, we have, um, of course, a lot of different ways that you can accomplish this, but the important thing is that you don't loot it for other things. It's not an in-house line of credit. Um, building systems. We're really talking about the mechanical systems as well as the building itself. So your electrical system, your plumbing, smoke and fire detection, if you have a security system, <coughs> heating, ventilating, air conditioning systems, those are all you know, systems we think about a lot. But the building enclosure also functions as a system. And so the roof, the walls, the windows, the doors, the floor, and the foundation are a system that keeps the exterior environment separate from the interior environment. It functions as a system. So we're really talking about all those physical components of the building when we talk about building systems. And finally, expected service life. When we talk about expected service life, we're really talking about how much time can you expect something to work correctly or keep doing its job. Manufacturers will often give us an example or an idea of what they think that might be for their products. It's usually fairly conservative. They want to under-promise and over-deliver. But for even things like roofs, for air conditioning compressors, um, for the paint on your windows and doors, we have a pretty good idea or we can figure out what that might be. And so we can plan, if we know this is a 25-year roof, and it's been 15 years or 25 years already since we put it on, we know we can start planning to make a replacement at some point. Your air conditioner, same thing. Um, we can, a lot of times, you know, keep those going with bailing wire and wishes, but at some point you're just going to have to replace that component. And if we're planning for it based on what we think the expected service life is going to be, then we often won't get into a lot of trouble. So I bang this drum all the time, all the time, because nobody does this, right? Everybody will tell you, well, if I had an extra bunch of money lying around to put in a savings account, I'd be doing something else with it. Or I just need to get one big gift, and then I'll put it in the bank, and I'll be done. Or, um, we had a little money once, but then we had to use it for something, and then we didn't pay it back. I can tell you that the folks who do this, who are prepared, are the ones who make a commitment to being prepared. And you don't need to have a bunch of extra money lying around, and you don't need to wait for a big giant gift. You can't loot it. You can't go, you know, gotta step away from the pig, but you can do it. And it really just takes making the decision to do it and then being disciplined about that. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So if you went to the pre-symposium workshop yesterday, I'm sure Patrick talked about assessing the building's condition. You need to know where you stand at the beginning, right? need to do a thorough examination to determine what is the current state of things, how much life do we have left in all of these different components, and can our building professional who is helping us with this tell us about what it's going to cost to replace them? Can we go ahead and get an estimate? Now, you might say, well, it doesn't help me to get an estimate now, because if I'm not going to have to replace my roof for 10 years, then an estimate now isn't going to make sense 10 years from now. But we can use it for planning purposes. Based on the current rates of inflation, you can expect your costs to increase about 10% for every five years. Right? So if we know 
that you have a $20,000 roof today, that's the cost it would be if you replaced it today, you're not gonna have to replace it for 20 years. You can figure, okay, that's about a 20, or about a 20% increase, so let's play it for $24,000 in 10 years. That's about the cost of inflation. Um, as you go through this, you know, get your systems checked, have your electrical panel checked, does it have enough um, capacity? Um, is your air conditioning system on its last legs, et cetera, et cetera? You can make yourself a little summary list about, you know, what is it, how is it um, doing right now, what are the issues, how much life does it have left, and what do they think it's going to take um, to replace it when we get going. That's the start of your building maintenance and systems replacement plan. Okay. So I gave everybody a, a sample spreadsheet. And this is just an example. Let's look at the numbers. You can move that information that you just got through your building, building condition assessment into a spreadsheet. You can use Excel if you have Microsoft Office. If you don't, there's a free online spreadsheet in Google called Sheets. And put it up in there, but it calculates everything for you. It makes it really, really easy. So let's be really clear that everybody's situation is different. Your haul is different. Your financial capacity is different. The revenue model is different, as we've heard from Deb. Everybody has a different way of approaching their business based on what works for them. And also, it matters if you're an individual running a dance hall or if this is a nonprofit or a fraternal organization. If you're the Schneider, folks at Schneider Hall, you have a different situation as a family than you know, somebody who is part of a, a greater organization with 50 members. But regardless of how you set it up, here's the information you need. So first of all, we've got um, expected expenses. Those are in the red box. So um, you need to know what information you need and um, when you're going to need it. So here we have, this is today's year, and then we have all the different years that we're gonna do stuff. And we've got an annual way, because you're gonna have the money that you have to spend every year. And this is like really high numbers, probably for most dance halls, but um, you get your annual maintenance budget, you're gonna have that every year. So expected service life, uh, one year. And then here's how much money we think that's gonna cost. So, oh, here we have to update our electrical wiring. That's gonna be good for 20 years. We're gonna do it in 2018, so that's gonna show up again in 2038. I don't believe that going past 20 years out is really necessary, but I do like to go that far because that almost always includes a roof. And the roof is the biggest issue that people have because you can get by with a lot of other stuff, but if you've got a leak in your roof, then that's a giant problem for your building. Water infiltration is probably one of the number one causes for hall deterioration, for building deterioration of any kind with historic buildings. So the roof is critical. Okay, so we plot out how much money we think we're gonna need, and um, we get that all in there, and then we look at where the money's gonna come from. Now, a lot of hall owners own their buildings. You know, they're not still making payments. You know, somebody bought that in you know, 1902 or whatever, and, and that's paid off by now. And what we hear from a lot of people is, well, I don't have to spend any money on my building. You know, I don't, I don't have any building costs. So a way around that, that I think is helpful is to treat yourself like a landlord and pay yourself rent. So if you know that if you were renting, you'd have to pay yourself, you have to pay your landlord rent, and then they would be responsible for the upkeep and maintenance on that building. Well, you can do the same thing, just be the landlord yourself. And by making a monthly rent payment into your building fund, you can build up that fund over time. For example, the roof that's going to cost $24,000, 
in 10 years. That's 120 months. That's $200 a month, if you don't count any interest that it will earn. $200 a month that you need to be putting back if you're going to have $24,000 in 10 years. I mean, that's, and that's easy math to do. We can determine what we're going to need and when we're going to need it. And the great thing is, if people know that that's what you're doing, that you are making a commitment to be a responsible steward of this building, <laughs> that's not about your business, it's about preserving this building for the community's future, for your grandchildren and their grandchildren, and that this is a legacy, a generational gift that you want to leave for the community, then it's a lot easier to get people to help with that. You know, nobody's going to pay you to have money for your business. You know, no extra money for you to have a building for your business to run in, right? But they will say, I can recognize that you're doing the right thing here. And so it's a lot easier to get community support for a building fund when it's going to be beyond you, when, it's, when you're really focused on preserving it for the future. So if we can tell that story, then um, it's a lot easier to get assistance with that. So let me tell you what we've got here. So here we've got some a monthly rent. And I like to put an annual increase in that. Rather than just say, okay, we're gonna need $200 a month for the roof forever, let's increase it every year by just a little bit that's doable for us. So if we look at maybe 3%, that's about $15 a month. And that only goes up once a year. And that's something we can think, huh, yeah, we could make that work. So when we multiply this by 12, we get your annual rent. If we look here, let's say we started with $5,000. We're going to put it in a place that it will be managed and it will grow. We can estimate 4 or 5% growth every year if we've got that in a money market fund that's um, relatively conservative but um, well managed. That's pretty common. Um, in terms of a number to plan for. So we can say, okay, we've got $5,000 to start with this year. We're going to gain $250 in interest if we're um, assuming a 5% return on that investment. And then we're going to put in an additional $5,400 $5, in rent. And we eventually, I don't know how I got rid of that number because that doesn't add up, but that um, should be these two things put together. And then that goes down the line. And as we put more money in, our balance grows, and then we'll have a big expense and it'll drop back down. But we can make a model spreadsheet like this and play around with the numbers to see, hey, you know, when are we going to need this money? Where could it come from? What, what should we be aiming for? What are our targets? And this is really just, you know, good financial planning. It's kind of like planning for your retirement, really, except you're doing it for the building instead. Um, one of the other things to keep in mind is that, especially if you are um, telling your story to the community, you want them to know that you're doing this as a long-term thing for the preservation of the building, for the community, not just for you, um, you need to have transparency. People need to know that you're not squirreling this money away and then you're going to, you know, go on a cruise with that money. You know, or use it for your own purposes. So if you set up a fund at the bank or with the community foundation where that can be invested for you, and if you're transparent in reporting, here's how much money we got this year, here's what we used it on, here's our goal for next year, that goes a long way to establishing trust and helping people um, be supportive when you're actually um, trying to build up these funds. All right, so where can the money come from? These are just a couple of ideas, and um, that will, of course, again, be different for everybody, but your best bet is to use small recurring contributions. 
So if you are a nonprofit, for example, and you have 50 members, it's really easy for most people to contribute $5 a month. That's a pretty easy number for most people to get to. And, you know, I grew up dirt poor, and my family still lives below the poverty line in a lot of places. But $5 a month, we could do. And you'll have people who could be more generous, but if you can get your members to chip in a recurring payment that they don't have to think about, that's um, automatically built to their credit card or their debit card or taking out their bank account, which requires e-commerce, you know, it would be scary. Um, but that is an easy, easy way to get um, a small amount of money in. You can, of course, have things like donation jars at fundraisers, um, if the volunteer fire department is going to use your hall for free, see if you can have a donation jar at the door or at the bar um, for a little bit of extra. You don't want to ask them for a cut, but um, because you need that volunteer fire department money. <coughs> but you can ask um, people to contribute, especially if you've done a good job telling your story about why you're raising money for the building fund. So a lot of this is about marketing why you're doing it, what your goals are, what you're planning to, to do with that money this year or next year, or you know whatever the next big thing is on your list, then it's easier to ask people to contribute to that. If you're renting the building, there are price points here. You can tag on an extra $20. $20 is easy. Right. For most people, $20 is not going to break the bank if you're renting a building. So you have to think about what makes sense for your market. And don't be, you know, greedy. But every dollar counts when you're raising money for your building fund. And you can use a lot of different things in combination, too. <coughs> if you've got a for-profit establishment, obviously you don't have members. But if you're going to have shows, can you tack on an extra dollar to the ticket price? If you're going to sell beer, what's about, what about another quarter of 50 cents to the beer price? Again, with the rental fees. You just have to think, what are the ways that we can raise money incrementally all year long? Not all at once. Not we have to raise you know, all the money in this one big fundraiser this one time. We don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. You know, we want to be working on it all the time. If you know anything about investing, you know that dollar cost averaging or putting money away all the time, not just once a year, is the best way to grow it. This is the same thing we want to do. We want to just be chipping in all the time, you know, whatever we can a little bit at a time to grow that building reserves fund so we've got it when we need it. All right, the other thing that um, if you were here yesterday, you heard a little bit about, I believe, is tax credits. Several states have tax credits for historic preservation. Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi all have them. Um, in Texas, we have a state historic uh, tax credit that is also for nonprofits. In Mississippi and Louisiana, I believe it's only for income producing for profit um, entities, but you can get a quarter of the money you spend on qualifying expenses back as a tax credit. So that's another way to spend the money and then get that tax credit and put it in your building fund. You know, don't spend it, put it in the building fund. Louisiana's tax credit. Um, is going to go down to 20% um, January 1st, 2018, and then it sunsets at the end of 2021. So if you're in Louisiana, you might want to go ahead and get on that tax credit business. There are also federal tax credits, which are very similar in terms of what they're aimed to do. The threshold for getting those tax credits can be a little higher in terms of the amount of work that you have to do in order to get them. Now, Emily Ardwin is here, my colleague, who's over in Houston with me now. Um, if you want to get tax credits, generally your building has to be recognized as historic, either on the National Register of Historic Places 
or by some other certifying organization like your state government or a city certified local government. Um, Emily is working on a multiple property submission for historic dance halls in Louisiana. And um, listing on that would enable those halls to be eligible for the state tax credit. No pressure. Um, we're working on starting one in uh, Texas to accomplish the same thing. And a multiple property submission is kind of like if you had a historic district with a whole bunch of properties, but they weren't anywhere near each other in the same area. Um, so the tax credit's also a really good way. Um, and here are your contacts. The Department of Preservation um, in Louisiana or the Texas Historical Commission in Texas, and I don't know in Mississippi, um, your historic, probably your state historic preservation office.